they were sitting looking at my game and they were smiling and for whatever reason um that didn't like that that didn't like affect me like directly but i actually in my mind i thought i saw a tactile idea and somehow i put two and two together and i thought that that, that they were smiling because there was some sort of trick in the position here uh, which sounds really ridiculous as a professional chess player to let anything like that get into your mind. But for whatever reason, that got, kind of did get into my mind. Um, and I blundered here. So we are going to be taking a uh, taking a look at my candidates games from 2016. Now, that is the only time that I did that I did qualify for the candidates turn the winner playing a match against Magnus Carlsen. And so we're going to jump right into it. So in the first game of the 2016 candidates, I played with the white piece against Fabiano Caruana. Now, ironically enough, you guys, in 2022, I will also be playing against Fabiano Caruana in the first round of the candidates tournament. And the reason for that is there is if there are players from representing the same country, they have to make so those players do not play in the last round of the event. So anyway, without further ado, let's jump right into it. So I play C4 here. Fabiano plays c5 g3 g6 now one difference between um or e3 bishop g2 e3 one difference between now and going back to 2016 is that in 2016 I had a long time before the Kansas tournament I believe I qualified in September of 2015 and the event was held in March of 2016 so I had a lot more time to prepare for the event uh roughly six months and uh, because of that it was much easier to prepare specifically for players and for what openings they would play um whereas this time around it's going to be a bit more of a challenge so e3 e6 is played i played d4 takes takes now another example this i think is a perfect example of why when i talk about preparation how difficult it is to come up with ideas and how you really have to pick your spots is that in this opening at the time this was not something that was known this was an idea that one of my seconds came up with to play this e3 move nowadays after ed4 everybody plays d5 plays a symmetrical setup and um and generally i think black is considered to be okay here now again there are still there still is a lot of play here but for example i had a game against vichy anand which i drew in zurich uh, maybe in 2017 i've had some other games as well and generally it's considered to be fine for black however at the time this was not so well known and so fabiano plays 97 which i think is considered slightly dubious i go d5 takes takes d6 and i play knight c3 now as i said so the idea worked in this game i got what i wanted out of the opening but nowadays most people know uh know better continuations so knight d7 knight f3 castles castles h6 h4 i will note you guys that this all was preparation up to this point i have looked at this line so the h4 move is a little bit unusual but even going back to 2016 computers still were suggesting moves that looked a little bit weird like like h2 to h4 here so knight to c5 is played i go rookie one bishop g4 bishop f4 thank you to e holterman for the 10 given subs appreciate it queen d2 your analysis so depth is, is so in-depth and precise i don't understand 99 percent of it though so over my head i'm well i mean i do tend to keep it at a very high level i always have done that um but i, I that's just how that's just how i roll so anyway queen d2 is played now i will note that one thing that's very tough tough um tough about uh about preparing for turns like the candidates is that again all this stuff i had looked up this this is already very far outside of outside of um outside of outside of what has been played or known like already here this position I think after knight c3 at the time very very rare position and so I, I was already like doing preparation going out well beyond this and this, this all was still within within my preparation but memorizing all these lines of course is very very difficult and so when people um so when people sort of wonder what I mean when I say like Jan over prepared for the world championship match it's where you look at all these lines that are somewhat obscure possibly never have been played before and you're still going to like move 15 or move 20 and things that very likely won't happen so Bishop f3 is played I take Queen f6 here I go rook a c1 and now Fabiano plays a5 now white is quite a bit better here white is the bishop pair uh the rooks are perfectly placed there's also a knight b5 idea later on and white is doing really really well you can even see from the computer the evaluation is very high I played knight b5 here I'm pretty sure I'm pretty sure by the way you guys this was still this was still my preparation I think right around here this bishop f6 move was the first move that I was unfamiliar with I think up to this point I had seen this position I think I looked at knight d3 rook d1 knight f4 was it I think it was rook b2 knight h5 I mean we're talking nearly we're talking like six years ago so I'm trying to remember what it was but um oh yes yes g4 takes bishop h1 and the knight d6 yeah yeah this is yeah this is exactly what it was um 
and, and, and white is much better here. This is about 1.3 for white. So yeah, it was, it was G4 Bishop H1. So up to this point, this is all this is all preparation. But again, the thing is like how realistic how realistic is it that you're gonna get to this position in the first place? So anyway, it goes Bishop F6 instead of Knight D3. As I said, this whole line should be very very good for white uh, with Knight D6. So he goes Bishop F6. Um, what a genius is what you want to say. No, but the reason that I remember it, you guys, is like. I don't remember the exact line, but one of the things that that, that gets involved with memory recall uh, when you're we're really deep in openings at the top level is players are generally there's a certain move within the sequence that they remember, and the reason that I remember this is not because these exact moves, but it's this bishop h1 move. As, as soon as this bishop h1 move, I see the computer say it, I I, I remember it. Um, it's un unbelievable you can remember all this. So it's like in general during a game, let's just say I got this position in a game here. Uh, and I had done preparation. The key in my mind would be I start doing the calculation. If, if I can remember that, this, that there's always a bishop h1 move somewhere, then I'll be able to play g4 because I know what the correct uh because I because I know I know one of the the one weird or unusual move in the sequence. And bishop h1 is a very unusual move. You put the bishop in the corner, it just doesn't look right. So this is what's important. So anyway, he goes bishop f6, which was the first move. Now, of course, again, one thing that's also very difficult here. Is that I guess nowadays as I let the computer sit for a bit, it does say Bishop F6 is the best move. But the computer the computer, I think, I think Bishop G7 maybe was also a move. But I know Bishop F6 was not the move that I had looked at here. So anyway, it goes Bishop F6, I take, takes, and he goes B6. Now again, computer gives white a big advantage here. But one of the difficult things is while the computer gives an advantage to a human here, it doesn't look very obvious why this is so great. Again, even material it's an end game sure you have a pass pawn but for example say rook d1 rook d8 i mean if you trade bishops opposite color bishops you're never winning this um and if you go like knight c4 for example even something like rook b8 even this position where you're up a pawn i mean you're, you're definitely better but there are drawing chances for black for sure so they're, they're definitely definitely to human doesn't seem very obvious why this is winning why this is really good but to the computer it's already saying white is much much better so i played rook b1 rook b8 and now I played knight c4, and this is where I essentially, um, as as my trainer Chris Littlejohn likes has likes to say over time, this is where Chris says that you know I I, ru I ruined history because Chris believes that if I had played the right move here, there's a good chance I would have won this tournament, and maybe I would have played a, played a, played a match against Magnus. So here the move that I played was this move knight c4. Now I remember during the game I had looked at the best move, which is knight b5, but it didn't really make a whole lot of sense to me objectively because I saw the pawn push. But the knight on b5 isn't doing anything other than supporting the pawn push. For example, say you get, get a position like this. What is the knight doing on b5? It only guards the pawn. So what I sort of miscalculated about this position is that the reason the knight is so good on b5 here is that it's outposted. This knight can never be removed. You have a dark square bishop, so it can't remove the knight. It's very hard to even offer a trade of knights. Like maybe you can go like knight e6, but even this, if you don't get knight d4, the knight is perma glued to b5. So it's actually a very, very strong move. And after knight b5, white is much better. But to me, when I played the game, I thought, well, knight c4 is more logical. First of all, first of all, I still support the d6 pawn push, but I also I attack the pawns on b6 and a5. So knight c4, it's it's a dual purpose move. I, I can push the pawn, but I also attack b6, so it's more logical. However, knight c4 is a big mistake, and after knight c4, white can no longer claim a big advantage. After knight b5, I, I, I don't remember if this is actually winning when you let the computer get really, really deep depth. But after bishop e5, d6 even, white is really, really, um, really, really pressing here because it's past pawn and this great knight on b5 that just guards it forever. So again, knight b5 is the move that I should have played. And as uh, as as Chris said, he he really he, he's really mad because he felt that if I had played that, I probably would have won the game. Instead, I played knight c4. Knight a4 is played here by Fabiano. Again, logical move. He guards the pawn. More importantly, though, now he can also go b5, and he also has knight c3 to create some forks as well. So I go bishop g4 here. Fabiano plays rook d8. I go d6, and now Fabiano plays h5 and b5. And just like that, there goes the pawn. Now I have to move the knight, and after I move the knight and lose the pawn, I'm never never going to be able to claim uh, claim an advantage. And so as we look at it, this is why chess is so 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 fascinating but also so incredibly frustrating because now even even in just the last few minutes that we've looked at this game it's very obvious why knight b5 is a great move you just push the pawn and the knight can never be removed whereas in the game it's not obvious at all that basically what happens is he gets his b5 and then because the knight is not outposted i end up losing the pass pawn and it's only about the pass pawn that's the only thing that matters um so it's very very difficult um 
And like, just looking at this, I mean, when you see a computer say a move like Knight B5, it's like, okay, I guess that's good, but why? And it's not obvious to, to us as humans until you see how the game progresses. And then it's like, oh man, it was just so obvious. It's the most obvious thing in the world. So anyway, so, so I go D6, B5 is played. I take Rook D6. And just like that, now I have no advantage, even material. I don't even have a pass pawn and it's just going to be a draw. So Knight C6, Rook B6, Knight B4. Knight c3, I play rook b3 here, and as as they, I think they still have 30 move draw rule in place, so we reach move 31. Fabiano would have played knight d5 here, and after we trade, opposite colored bishops, even material, no imbalance, should be a draw. So that's the first game. Very disappointing, obviously, at the time, because certainly I was very wound up, very, um, very, the stress was definitely quite high already, and the fact that I got exactly what I wanted in this game um where i got i got i got out to move uh move 20 where it was all preparation and then had the advantage but to not go knight b5 uh was very unfortunate because i think if i had played knight b5 i suspect i would have won this game and history would have been much different i probably would not be a streamer today either honestly so knight b5 is so good sure but it's not obvious because as a human you think well it only supports a pawn push but again like i said if you look at this if you look at this position it's like okay but so what I mean, the pawn's not going anywhere. I mean, the d7 square is covered, uh, but the difference is that eventually, with the knight, be knight being on b5 and unable to be removed, you will be able to go like rook d1, bishop c6, d7. You might even have a knight a7 idea as well here. So, yeah, it's one of those things that's just very, very frustrating. As I said, after the game, of course, I looked and I saw the computer gave knight b5. Even at the time, I think it said it was about 1.4, and I was very, very disappointed. So this is the first game that we're going to go over. How much time was taken on the first 30 moves? I think up until move 20, I'd use maybe a few minutes. I don't know if they're timestamps anymore from the game, but this was definitely preparation still. And the reason I know it's prep is because this line that I just alluded to with knight d3, I've seen this line before. I'm 100% sure that I've seen this line with knight d6, uh, with this bishop h1 knight d6. So again, this is the first game we're going to go over. So we'll keep moving along. Let's go to the second game. So let's go to the second game which I played with the black pieces against a certain player who is banned from chess at the moment. So D4 was played on the first move, knight f6, c4, e6, knight f3, and now I played b6 here. Now, to give you guys some backstory on the candidates in 2016, I hired uh, Peter Leko, the, the famed Hungarian chess player, world championship, camp, world championship challenger, who came within one draw of becoming world champion, lost the final game of his match, against Vladimir Kramnik and Brasago and I think 2012 maybe or 2010 I don't remember when it was uh, but I hired him and so I thought by hiring him uh his his big specialty is that he's a very rock solid player he's he's also known as Draco sometimes similar to draw drawnish or draw Geary you know one you know similar similar sort of stuff um so I I hired him to uh to come on board i thought he's very solid he has a very specific opening which is he plays the queen's indian defense not the queen's gambit because of course uh that's that's too uh too hip so dronish geary right dronish geary that was the name so so as i was saying i hired him one of the reasons you also generally do not um you do not talk about the people that you work with is is because um is because there are players who are specialists in certain openings so for, I'll, I'll, I'll make it simpler. Let's say, for example, um, let's say, for example, I'm like, OK, you know what? Tomorrow I'm hiring the I'm hiring. I'm hiring Pistol Peter. I'm hiring Peter Savidler. He's going to be part of my team. I'm hiring him. The problem with that is that Peter, again, very specific player for, with the black pieces. He almost exclusively plays the uh, plays the Grunfeld. And then with the white pieces, I guess he started to mix it up. He plays E4, D4, C4. But again, if I hire Peter Savidler and I say to the world that he's he's part of my team, people are be like, aha, you're hiring because of the Grunfeld, of course, because he only plays one, one main opening with the black piece against D4. So yeah, MVL is a good example. If I'm like, okay, yeah, I'm hiring Max. I'm just gonna be like, okay, well, Hikaru is obviously playing the, he's going to be playing the Night Orphan. He's going to be playing the Grunfeld. Very simple, very straightforward. So that's why you don't really hear about players talking about their team until after the event. With Jan Pomniachi and the candidates, he, I believe, after he won the candidates, he sort of revealed most of his team, not all of it. And then, of course, after the World Championship, I think he just revealed uh, his entire team. But that's generally why players don't talk about it prior to the event. So anyway, I played the Queen's Indian defense. Big mistake. Now, I will talk more about, about why, in retrospect, when I look at my entire chess career, this is probably my single greatest regret. But I'll get to that with a later game that we look at. So g3 is played. I play bishop a6, b3, bishop b4, bishop d2, bishop e7, bishop g2, d5. All pretty normal. Now, one of the reasons I think this was a big mistake is because the queen's Indian defense was also a main opening that Sergei, Sergei Karyakin played 
uh, prior to the event. So it's something that everybody was looking at before the event anyway. And I think that was a big mistake by me. So C takes D5, E takes D5 is played. Castles, castles, knight C3. And now here I play a very, very sad move. I play this move, knight BD7. Now the reason this is so sad is because prior to the event, I had done some, um, I had done some training camps and I, I obviously done a lot of memorization, thinking a lot about these openings. But the problem is that when you play an opening like the Queen's Indian Defense, it's all about move orders. And in this position, the correct move to play or the move that I had looked at at the time was the move Bishop B7. But then again, when you're reviewing a million lines before the game, you're not really sure what's going on and you feel that pressure. You're like, okay, what if he does this? What if he does that? You look too much. Then you can, then you can end up forgetting a uh, move order. And I play Knight BD7, which is not the move order or it's not what I had looked at prior to the, uh, prior to the event. So I play Knight BD7, goes Queen C2, which of course is not the, not the best move. I believe Knight E5 here in white can claim uh claim a significant advantage if i remember this correctly although it should be some bishop f4 wait isn't 95 bishop f4 there was something about this yeah actually no i think i, I think i think it was bishop b7 95 and i think it was i think was it rookie eight i think i think the move that i looked at was something like rookie eight here i'm not sure of the exact move order now but I think this was what I looked at. It was Bishop B7, 95, Rook E8. And by playing Knight D7 after 95, Bishop B7, it's a slightly different position. So anyway, is over prepping worse than not prepping at all? Hard to judge. But okay, Knight D7, Queen C2. I go Rook E8 here. Again, you guys see this is the problem. You see, I in my mind, I was already, my mind had already turned to um turned to mush. So I tried to play Rook E8 and get back into the lines that I thought I had looked at. So see, the correct move was here, 95 Rook E8, or I think even Queen C2 Rook E8, if I'm not mistaken. But then I go here, and instead of instead of sort of realizing that I've done something wrong, I thought I was still in prep. So I tried to follow it by playing Rook E8, whereas here I should have gone Rook C8 followed by C5. And black is actually completely fine here, by the way. However, having said that, this is also why it's very, very difficult because Sergei clearly, he had not looked at this. He had only looked at Bishop B7, so probably Sergei had repeated a million different lines before the game. And then when I play the move that's not right, at the board, he plays a logical move, but it's not precise, and I have a chance to get back into the game if I had played Rook C8 and C5 here. Instead, after Queen C2, I play Rook E8. He goes Rook D1, and now I play Knight F8. Again, not, not a good move at all, completely losing the thread. What I should have been doing here is I really should have probably at this point realized something was wrong and just looked at the board fresh instead of trying to trying to get back in the lines or think about preparation and various piece placement that I had before. So I go Knight F8, which is not a good move. He goes Knight E5. I go Bishop B7, plays Bishop C1, which by the way, I think inadvertently here, Sergey is kind of transposed back into my preparation, if I'm not mistaken, um, because I did get Rook E8, Bishop B7, and I got the Knight to F8 here. So he goes Bishop C1, I play Knight E6, Bishop B2. Idea behind this, by the way, is White wants to go E3, but, but also the Bishop on B2 will always be guarding on this diagonal against any threats. And if later on, let's say we trade at some point, he might be able to open up this diagonal, potentially. So that's the reason for, for maneuvering the bishop back to b2 here. I go bishop d6, e3, play a6. Why knight e6 and not knight g6? Very good question. If I go knight g6 here, white can play f4 and get a big grip on this pawn, on this knight on e5. Whereas the idea behind knight e6 is I want to go c5 and really put a lot of pressure on the pawn on d4. So bishop d6, e3, a6 is played, knight e2. Again, if I, if I take after takes, this diagonal opens a lot of pressure in the center here towards d5. So I go c5 here, Sergei takes, I take back, and now he goes knight d3. And this is actually a dream. A lot of you guys probably have seen my games with various fianchitos, like g3 and b3 and bishop g2, b2, where my opponent gets an isolated pawn on d5. And in this position with the isolated pawn on d5, it's just very hard to play this diagonal towards g7. Very tough, very, very strong bishop on b2. The other diagonal is a big problem too towards d5. So it's very, very hard to play. So I go knight, knight c e4. Rook a c1 is played. Rook c8, queen b1. Again, big advantage for white. You can go like knight f4, potentially say I play a move like h6. You've got knight f4. Lot of pressure here. Everything is everything is definitely un, under pressure in the center. Um, additionally, white can also go queen a1 here to put even more pressure towards the knight on f6 and the pawn on g7. So I go queen e7, bishop d4 is played here, and now I go rook takes c1, rook takes c1, and I play this move b5. Again, another move that's not very attractive because I now create a weakness on c5. White can maybe go b4 and knight c5 at some point as well. So he goes b4, I go knight d7 here, a3, knight f8, bishop a1, logical move to maybe line up a battery towards g7. Again, ideas like knight d4, knight f4, also c5 is a big weakness as well. 
So knight e6, queen a2. Which I don't know why Sergei played queen a2 and not queen b2. It's kind of a, it's a rather peculiar move the more I look at it. I don't, I guess the idea must have been that he thought he could go knight f4 and target d5. And that has to be the reason is he just thought something like this with the, the idea of targeting the pawn. But it still seems like a slightly peculiar move. So I go bishop c7. Idea behind bishop c7, very simply to go bishop b6 and line up pressure on the diagonal. Knight d4, bishop b6. H4 is played here. And now this is where I made a huge blunder. And this sounds fairly embarrassing to say, uh, but I but I will say this. I remember at the time during this game, it was around this time, I looked into the audience and um, and I actually saw the FIDE president at the time, Kirsan Ilium Jinov. I think he was sitting with... Um, Who's he sitting with? I don't remember his as my project really. Who he was sitting with? But they were sitting looking at my game and they were smiling. And for whatever reason, um, that didn't like that that didn't like affect me like directly. But I actually in my mind I thought I saw a tactile idea and somehow I put two and two together and I thought that that, that they were smiling because there was some sort of trick in the position here. Uh, which sounds really ridiculous as a professional chess player to let anything like that get into your mind. But for whatever reason, that got, kind of did get into my mind. Um, and I blundered here. So what I did is I just made a very basic miscalculation. So my calculation was that I could take and I could take on d4. And now if white takes with the pawn, I go queen e3 check, getting the king, the rook, and the knight. If white blocks with the knight, I have queen c1, which is winning. If white blocks with the queen, I just take the knight and I'm up a pawn here. And if white moves the king, I just take the knight on d3. A girl smiled at me and I blundered. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yes, that's the that, that would be a little bit less embarrassing. Um, but anyway, so yeah, so I take, and the problem is after knight takes d4 here, white can actually take with a bishop. And after we trade, I go queen e3 check. Again, same idea, hitting everything at the same time. Now white has queen to f2 here. And, and of course, I can't take the rook because the knight takes queen. And after queen takes knight, white has rook c7 here. And he's attacking both the bishop and the pawn on b7 and f7. And just like that, I'm completely lost. I move the bishop, he takes the pawn and his checkmate. And so I can't really move the bishop, but I play like rook f8, he just takes. So I go f6 here, or f5, sorry, he takes on b7, play h6, takes, king h7, Sergei just goes bishop g2, safe move to bring the bishop back, because of course if he gets too, too aggressive like bishop f7, there might be tricks like queen d1 and rook e2, for example, or queen f1, rook e1. So Sergei very precisely just brings the bishop back, understanding that the, the king will be very safe on g1. So I play rook e2, goes bishop f1, and I resign the game here, and I lose the second round of the 2016 Day Candidates Tournament. Very, very unfortunate the way that I, I lost this game, but this is one of those things which will definitely be different this time around, not so much in like blundering or not getting distracted, but in the, from the standpoint that as soon as I got to this position, as soon as I got to this to one of these early positions with the isolated pawn, somewhere right around here, I knew that I was in trouble and I was there, there was a lot of pressure, and it, it definitely kept building throughout the game. Whereas now, for example, if I get into a bad position like this, and I probably shouldn't be saying this, of course, but um, considering I'm playing the tournament, but if I get into a bad position like this, my attitude is very different. It's like, okay, I mean, it's not a good position. There, there's a pretty decent chance I might lose the game, but it's not the end of the world. I don't sort of start having these negative thoughts about like losing the game or what that means in the bigger picture. Whereas at the time, already here, it's like, I'll, I'll, I'll just, I'll use some bad language because I, I can. In my mind, I was already at this point going like, it's like, it's like, oh shit, I'm in trouble. Oh shit, I have to defend. I can't lose this game. I can't lose. So if I lose, I'm not going to win the candidates. And so in my mind, I had those sorts of thoughts going on. Um, whereas now I just don't have any of those thoughts at all. My thought, my thoughts now are just like, okay, it's a bad position. Try to find some good moves, whatever. If you lose, you lose. It's not the end of the world. Whereas definitely at the time, I felt like it was the end of the world. So, um, so that's uh, that. That's just what I would add in terms of the general thought process that I had going on dur during the game.